Hi everybody, I'm uh, Peter Laws and this is the Flicks the Church for God, the show where I explore the deeper and the sometimes spiritual themes of horror movies. Now, uh, for this episode, I'm going to do um, my first ever top 10 video. And for this, I'm going to go a little bit obscure. Yes, these are going to be the top 10 moments in horror where characters look at screens. Bear with me. We spend a lot of our time staring at screens in life as you are doing this very second. So how heartwarming to know that the practice carries on in the world of horror movies. In fact, looking at screens happens so often in horror films that you can almost call them cliche. You know the moment a character is unraveling some sort of mystery and at some point they sit in front of a TV or a computer or microfilm viewer in the library and as the music swells in the background, we discover some new ominous plot point. I've got a novel coming out in shops next year and I made sure that that definitely had a looking at the screen moment because I kind of love them. Yeah, to some audiences, these uh, moments in fiction and film are purely functional moments of exposition to move the story along, but call me odd, but I just kind of love these quiet moments in horror films. And I do remember watching the scenes, the 10 scenes that I'm about to show you, some of them as a kid, feeling particularly chilled by this device of screen watching. You see, these scenes aren't usually about action, but rather they're about moments where fresh information is, is given. And this information uh, tends to deepen the mystery and the terror of the plot surrounding the characters. In other words, looking at screen moments in horror movies tend to make the entire film feel that little bit more ominous. And I'm afraid I just happen to be somebody who has a taste for the ominous in films. And these moments of spooky revelation um, did have a habit of getting under my skin when I used to watch them as a kid and growing up and still now. So let's go all goggle box and postmodern while you watch a screen, while I watch a screen of other people watching screens. And hopefully along the way, we might get a little bit spooked. By the way, uh, none of these really contain massive big spoilers for the films in question because they simply deepen and reflect the synopsis of the film already. But you know, if you're in doubt, watch the films first. But anyway, let's start off with ghosts. So at number 10, we've got The Changeling from 1980. Now, if this was going to be a top 10 list of the scariest scenes in movies, then there are lots more to choose from from this particular film, because for me, The Changeling is probably, in my opinion, the best haunted house movie I've ever seen. Uh, so the, st the staring at the screen moment in this film isn't particularly scary, but what it does do is help to deepen the plot of the film because it starts to unravel the history behind the house in question. Um, in the film, George C. Scott plays John Russell. He's a composer who's grieving uh, over the death of his wife and daughter, and so he moves into this like mahusive, forbidding house where strange paranormal activities start to begin. And in the scene you're about to see, he scrolls through microfilm or microfiche, if they call it that, to discover that his grief over his death and his wife of his wife and child isn't the only loss that's been felt in that house. No, there are other deaths that linger on. Seriously, if you've never seen The Changeling, you need to check it out. Uh, only you must watch it at night. You must have the lights off. Uh, oh, and by the way, you can check out my um, two-part in-depth review of The Changeling at my podcast page. Okay, coming in at number nine, we've got The Fly from 1986. David Cronenberg's remake of The Fly uh, showed Jeff Goldblum's character, Seth Brundle, who was um, building a working teleportation chamber. Excitedly, he believes this will revolutionize world transport, and it does. Uh, it would, I mean. Um, but the atoms, it, basically the atoms of any type of matter can be deconstructed and transmitted and then reconstructed at the other end basically a little bit like Wonka TV. Only in one experiment, he didn't count on something getting into the teleporter or transporter with him. In this looking at a screen scene, Bun Brundle starts to realize just what it was that got in there with him um, and how it might explain why his body is slowly starting to rebel and mutate, why he's growing coarse black hairs on his back, for example. 
Now, the fly is a, is a brilliant allegory of the power of disease. And this moment of revelation that we're about to see is probably replicated by many people who are ill and scroll through the internet self-diagnosing themselves with horrendous diseases. Only in some cases, and in particularly this case of Seth Brundle, the condition is beyond doubt. There's a lot of standout moments in the fly, the arm wrestling scene being one of them. Uh, but I do remember that when I first saw this as a teenager, it was this realization in this moment, along with Howard Shaw's shivery score, that really gave me the chills. Give me a disc. Uh, I need the first teleportation, S. Brundle. We're going to stick with David Cronenberg now for number eight for his 1983 surreal horror film, Videodrome. It's a fantastic movie, and you can check out my in-depth video review of it on my YouTube channel. But if there was ever a film that is about the power of looking at screens, it's this. TV programmer Max Wren discovers that the CD exploitation show that he's been seeing on Pirate to TV is way more powerful than he imagined. It's just that it won't only entertain the viewer, it will warp their entire perception of reality. Now, there's a lot of looking at screen scenes in Videodrome, and I could have picked, I guess, the most famous one where the TV turns into a fleshy pair of lips um, and he sticks his head in. Well, hey, um, but I opted for this more subtle clip because the character on the screen, Brian Oblivion, is able to share the philosophy behind the movie. And for me, that really only went to deepen the chills and the sense of ominous nature of Videodrome. The battle for the mind of North America will be fought in the video arena. The video drone. The television screen is the retina of the mind's eye. Therefore, the television screen is part of the physical structure of the brain. Therefore, whatever appears on the television screen emerges as raw experience for those who watch it. Therefore, television is reality. And reality is less than television. Max. I'm so glad you came to me. I've been through it all myself, you see. Your reality is already half video hallucination. If you're not careful, it will become total hallucination. You'll have to learn to live in a very strange new world. I had a brain tumor, and I had visions. I believed the visions 
caused the tumor and not the reverse. I could feel the visions coalesce and become flesh. Uncontrollable flesh. But when they removed the tumor, it was called Videodrome. I was the... I... I... was Videodrome's first victim. But who's behind it? What do they want? I want you, Max. Okay, now we've reached number seven, and we fast forward to 2002 when M. Night Shyamalan, shall I am, I can never say his name. Anyway, Signs, his crop circle horror, um, came out. The ending of this flick might have been seen as a bit corny and contrived, but the build up and the execution of the film I think was pretty darn inspired. There's a bunch of scenes I like in Signs, but here's the one that really got my heart racing when I first saw it in the cinema. Now, watching it back, um, it's lost some of its power, but the first time I saw it, it was a perfect looking at a screen scene. It deepens the plot, it makes everything feel a lot more ominous with this intense visual of the alien threat. But pay close attention to the score as well, which picks up on a fluttery little motif that's been playing gently before in the film. But now it builds up into this massive crescendo. And also look at Joaquin Phoenix's reaction when he sees this on the screen and he flings himself back um, from what he doesn't want to uh, compute, he doesn't want to admit to, but it's real. It really pumps the tension into this uh, moment. Uh, and also what especially works, look out for this, is the ubiquitous lines that the newsreaders often say. Words that always get you on edge before watching a clip on a screen. Though it's difficult to look away and the words are this. What you're about to see may disturb you. The startling footage we're about to show you was photographed by a 42-year-old, Romero Valadares. This video was taken yesterday afternoon at his son's seventh birthday in the city of Paso Fundo, Brazil. It was sent to the local news bureau there and sent to us via satellite just a few minutes ago. All initial opinions are this is genuine. What you're about to see may disturb you. <laughs> Okay, here's number six, and let me say that I am an absolute sucker for the 1981 horror film Evil Speak, starring Clint Howard. Yeah, I know it's panned by many critics, and a lot of horror fans see this film and just kind of shrug, but I tell you, I think it is a cracking horror movie. I really, really like it. Um, so it's, okay, it's a kind of just a riff on Stephen King's Carrie, where um, Clint Howard's character, Cooper Smith, is just picked on so much at a military academy that he takes his bloody revenge in the final reels. But what Evil Speak adds into the mix is computers with clunky buttons, Satanism, and a herd of demonic pigs. Now you can actually check out my in-depth review of um, evil speak at my podcast page but for now here's one of the film's several looking at a screen moments and it's a part of the film that just really unnerved me when I saw it for the first time you may find it boring I found it really quite unnerving poor Cooper Smith just wants to get on with making a wooden catapult for his catapult class I guess um, but the students and the staff at his college bully him so much that he's lost all faith in people and the friendless nobody has to look out for outside help but where does he get it in a long-dead devil worshipper called Esteban. 
And here in this scene, he types in sections of Esteban's diary into his computer and reads out the tran so reads back the translations. And I don't know, there's something about the words of Esteban and the fact that they seem to be appealing to this lonely bully ball, uh, bully boy, um, just really creeped me out. Especially the last one with its slow zoom. Oh, and it probably didn't help that I was about 11 when I first saw this video, Nasty, that was banned at the time. Oh, anyway, just also check out the flickery green computer screen and the brilliant squelchy synth soundtrack by Roger, Roger Kellaway. I do not understand you, Cooper Smith. You have a fine mind. If only you would apply yourself. Well, I do try, sir. Well, you know my model catapult? I'm using one of the computers to check my configurations, so it'll be really accurate. Hmm. I hope it is for your sake. Now you'd best get out of here. You'll be late for your next class. Yes, sir. So Evil Speak was underrated, uh, I think, in my opinion. And do you want to know what other horror film is underrated, I reckon? It's the fifth scene on our list from the Amityville Horror, the original. Now, I'd seen a bunch of horror movies when I was young as a kid, but this one scared the crap out of me. And the fact that it was linked potentially to a true case always gave it that added edge. And hey, even if the Lutz's story of the Amityville haunting was made up, I'm undecided on that subject. The, the DeFeo murders that happened in the house a year beforehand are an absolute matter of fact and record. Now, there's a whole lot of scenes in the Amateurville Horror, which um, I personally found scary when I saw it, and I still find it scary now. But um, the film's looking at a screen moment did really jangle my nerves at the time. Margot Kidder is playing Kathy Lutz, who along with her family have moved into the Amateurville home for cheap since it was uh, the site of a horrendous family murder the year before. And now um, she is terrified of the strange demonic activity that she's starting to see occurring in her home. But what is worse and what's more unsettling is that her husband's personality, James Brolin, is changing. He's becoming more and more angry. He's got a murderous look in his eye. And so in this scene, she does the ubiquitous searching through the local newspapers on microfilm, and she looks back into the history of the murders of the house. But she finds a picture of the killer, Ronald DeFeo, only she sees the face of her husband, George, there instead. Or rather, she realizes that her husband, George, is slowly becoming Ronald DeFeo, or at least he is becoming possessed by the same demon that fueled that horrendous murder of the DeFeos 12 months before. 
yeah, okay, it's kind of cheesy and melodramatic, this scene, but I still love it. Oh, and this clip gets bonus points for how adorable Margot Kidder looks in her giant glasses. I think this has all the good stuff. I mean the uh, major coverage. If there's anything else that you need to want to see, I'll, I'll go back here and get no, it. No, I think this will be fine. And yeah, that's what I thought. This is the November 14th issue. That's the day after the murders. Now that crank over there, you turn that crank that, and that one there? right there, it advances okay. the film. Fine. Each frame is a whole page. And to get it in focus, you just turn this knob right here. Okay, I've got it. Yeah. Okay, you yeah. all set now? I'm fine, I'm fine. Good. Okay, coming in at number four, we have a film that doesn't just uh, feature a looking at screen scene, but rather the entire plot of this film is based around the dangers of watching images on TV. In Ringu, I don't think that's how you pronounce it, though it sounds like Pingu, it was later uh, remade in Hollywood as The Ring, this film features a, a cursed videotape that anybody who looks at it will soon die. It's a popular idea in Japanese horror at the time that technology might be the conduit for supernatural forces. Now, um, it's all hinged here on a long-haired woman who lives in a well. These days, the, the old uh, Japanese lady with long, lank, hanging black hair is as cliche in horror as a car breaking down outside a haunted house. So it's very easy to forget how much this looking at a screen moment scared the heck out of people when it was first screened back in 1998.
Okay, we're reaching the heady heights of number three now with a movie from 1978. The 1970s was a hotbed of paranormal interest from UFOs, the Bermuda Triangle, psychic phenomenon in particular, which is what this film's about. Uri Geller and others were wowing the world with spoon bending and mind power. And naturally, the horror world didn't take long to dive into the psychic fun with films like the aforementioned Carrie, um, the sender Patrick, among many, many others. But here's the looking at a screen moment from one of my uh, absolute favorite psychic horror movies and that is the medusa touch now this is a, a i think a fairly underrated horror thriller starring the mighty richard burton who plays a man who has the power to create catastrophe with his mind and um throughout the film we see he's able to like just cause plane crashes and suicides just with the power of thought it's a really chilling exciting film i think and this uh looking at a screen scene really gets to the heart of the 70s fascination with psychic phenomenon basically what's happening here is that the policeman uh, who's investigating richard burton's character is given a videotape with evidence of mind power now there's way more creepy and noteworthy moments in the medusa touch but this screen moment does help to establish that burton might not be the only one in the world with the power to create uh, catastrophe through thought and that idea this idea of truly dangerous minds existing and being a growing worldwide phenomenon is an interesting part of the film and which is of course what david cronenberg would run with a few years later with scanners Well, Inspector, we've traced these experiments on telekinetics and mental powers. The first one is fairly familiar. It demonstrates the power of the mind to dominate pain. It's in the tradition of lying on spikes and walking on hot coals. This second experiment is much more interesting. The boy's head is linked to a kind of scoreboard. By the power of his thoughts, he can turn on lights and ring bells. This film is one of the most famous of telekinetic demonstrations. Kulagina is just a Leningrad housewife and grandmother. Over 40 high-ranking scientists examined her for hidden magnets, wires and other artificial aids. There were none. They could give no explanation of her powers to move objects. <laughs> Lastly, and the most dramatic, this young history teacher is going to try to will this sheet of glass to shatter. Okay, folks, so we now come to what I would say is my scariest looking at a screen moment. It's from the film The Babadook from 2014, a film that wowed critics and terrified audiences. And it was an emotionally draining um, exploration of the power of grief, basically where a young woman and her son, a six-year-old son, has to learn to cope with the death of her husband. Now, if you want my in-depth review of The Babadook, you can check out my uh, YouTube channel, but just 
in a nutshell, it is a really draining, emotionally and frightening experience. And funnily enough, I found that the scariest moment in the film was it's looking at a screen moment. There's a few of those, but it's this one in particular I want to show you. Here, the grieving widow Amelia is trying to build a life after her husband dies, but she's sort of fallen into some sort of paranoid depression. But what makes it especially stressful is that she has to look after her um, six-year-old son, Sam, and she is struggling to cope with that. Amelia is trying hard throughout the film to be calm and all smiles for him, but the frustration with being alone and dealing with uh, this child in the midst of all of this grief is slowly growing into resentment, paranoia, and a worrying sense of anger. In this scene, uh, she sits at night and she watches a horrible news report about a child murder. And for many of us, if we see those sorts of reports on TV and the news, we would think, how could they, that person do that? But there are others in the world who, when they hit a level of such stress, they might watch a news item like that and say, not how could they do that, but rather, my God, that could have been me. I could do that. This looking at a screen scene, I think, captures the frightening worry and realization in Amelia in a very unsettling fashion. Oh my word, that facial expression, that smile on her face. I just watched that again last night, that, that scene. And um, I was afterwards I had to switch out the lights downstairs and I just kept imagining her like grinning out of the conservatory windows. <laughs> it's cool though. Anyway, um, by the way, that clip isn't a really big spoiler of the film or anything. So you have, if you haven't seen The Babadook, you can still check it out. I haven't shown a lot of it. It's on Netflix in the UK at the moment, incidentally. Hello, I just have to interrupt my own uh, video for a second because when I edited this and I got back home, I suddenly realized I had missed out a classic looking at screen moment in horror, which I didn't include in my top 10 list and therefore I'm putting in a, a sort of a 0.5 um, between two and one clip um, because it, you cannot look through looking at screen moments in horror without addressing Halloween 3 Season of the Witch. I can't believe I didn't think of it earlier when I was doing this. Um, basically the idea that um, little kids are going to buy these pumpkin mask, um, pumpkin headed mask things and witch masks and skull masks and behind them they've got these little silver shamrock dials on the back and when they watch the screens, um, they watch the magic pumpkin on Halloween night, it will set off some weird Stonehenge based signal which will turn their heads. Well, you'll see. Here is a classic um, example of a screen moment. Ha ha ha. All right, roll it. It's time. It's time. Time for the big No, no, this is just the same old stuff. It's come. All you lucky kids with silver shamrock masks, gather round your TV set, put on your masks, and watch. Honey, don't get too close. You'll ruin your eyes. Jack o' lanterns. Gather round and watch. Watch the magic pumpkin. Watch. <laughs> I think this whole thing is a big joke. I mean, look at this. <laughs> Oh, my God. 
Well, so far we've had screen staring moments that have led to personal tragedy and horror, but I want to now widen it out for the final one to the total apocalypse of the world, which I guess that's why it makes it number one. Although, by the way, these aren't ranked in order of brilliance, they're just in this order. For that, we turn to John Carpenter's The Thing from 1982. You can check out my in-depth review of that film on my pod. You're getting the theme here on my podcast page, by the way. Now, the men of an Antarctic research... Is it Antarctic or Arctic? I can't remember right now. Anyway, they've all been infiltrated by an alien organism that has the power to assimilate into other beings and mimic them. Hmm, awkward. Uh, and here the station's doctor taps facts into his computer to extrapolate how fast this contag contagion would spread if it ever reached civilization. The Thing is a brooding, bleak film anyway. But I found that this looking at a screen moment was one of the most ominous parts of the whole movie. Because basically it's the realization that this alien creature wasn't just spelling the end for these unfortunate men. But actually they had just stumbled onto the death sentence of the entire planet. So there you have it, my top 10 staring at a screen moments in horror. You know, I'm not really sure why I like these looking at a screen scenes, but I reckon it might be because I do love action and suspense and spectacular set pieces in horror, but I personally find myself drawn to the themes and the ideas behind the horror movies themselves. That's what creeps me out the most, and that's one of the reasons I present this, this show, um, to dig into the deeper ideas of scary films. And perhaps that's why I've also got a soft spot for these looking at a screen moments. Because they are the times, I think, in horror films when the pace slows down just for a few minutes so that the audience firstly can take in some new plot information, that's very important, um, but also uh, so that they can really get to grips with the gravity of how bad the situation is in the film. In The Fly, we're left with this devastation word, fusion. You know, the melding of animal and insect at a subatomic level. In the Amateurville horror, we're thrown into the theme of demonic possession and the idea of a spirit of hate and violence warping the world. In my, little, my, my cool little film, Evil Speak, which I like, um, we learn the only hope this poor guy in the world has is an ancient devil worshipper who believes that Satan is God. And in The Babadook, we're confronted with the idea that given the right conditions we could all snap and the fear of what that could do what we could do in situations where we lose our minds that's chilling 
when you watch films, it's worth looking out for these looking at a screen moments um, to, because they, they can help you work out and whittle down the entire film to its essential messages, to its deepest themes. Now, of course, there's plenty of other um, on-screen examples in horror movies I could have shared. For example, I mean, the one that really came to mind was the harrowing and really quite horrible moment in Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer, where two sociopaths are watching the crimes they videotaped, and that scene shows them as horribly voyeuristic until we realize um, that the audience, like us as the audience, are doing exactly the same thing we are. We're sitting watching them watching their own work. I decided not to include that scene because personally I find it quite disturbing. Um, sorry. Um, or oh, there's other on-screen moments that didn't quite make the cut, like the gorgeous Brian De Palma thriller Blowout, where John Travolta's character stares at a screen as he tries to match up a sound recording to solve a political murder. But, you know, that's not really quite horror, so I couldn't really put it in the list, so alas, it hit the cutting room floor. But rest assured, as long as scriptwriters want to reveal important plot information to the viewers without having a character clumsily coming in and saying it is exposition, then we're always going to have these staring at a screen moments in fiction and film. And I think that suits me completely fine because, as you can probably see already, I think they can be really effective mechanisms not only to deepen plot, but also to creep us out. And look, if you like looking at screens, then you've come to the right place because you can subscribe to my YouTube channel uh, and watch a whole bunch of videos, including um, my in-depth horror movie reviews and also some horror movie song covers. And I also have, um, if you don't want to listen, look at screens, you can listen to my podcast. If you're up for it, you can follow me on Twitter at RevPeterLaws or you can visit the website, theflicksthechurchforgot.com. Or um, you can read my monthly horror movie column in the Fortune Times magazine, available in all good news agents now. But until next time, look out and remember, the next time you're looking at a screen, don't forget that in all likelihood these days, that screen is probably looking back at you. And also, don't forget the flicks the church forgot. <laughs>